So hi everyone, and thank you for joining us today. So my name is Dana, and I'm representing the Marine Conservation Group of the Nature Society Singapore. So before we begin, I would just like to do a brief introduction about the Nature Society. Next slide, please. So Nature Society Singapore is a non-government, non-profit organization, and we work to foster the awareness and appreciation of nature and to advocate the conservation of these natural spaces here in Singapore. Today's event is organized by the Marine Conservation Group, also known as the MCG, and is one of the many interest groups that NSS has. So the MCG was formed to encourage the understanding and protection of marine nature in Singapore and Southeast Asia. The activities are focused on increasing awareness and limiting threats to marine ecosystems. MCG conservation projects include the endangered species monitoring activities. For example, the Horseshoe Crab Rescue and Research Program, which began in 2007. So this 14 year old initiative started off as a conservation effort to rescue the horseshoe crabs that were trapped in deployed and abandoned fishing nets at the Mandai mudflats. It then evolved to become a basic research to just understand more about this little known ancient creature, which is as old as the dinosaurs. But over the years, we have had students from primary schools, secondary schools, junior colleges and tertiary institutions collaborating in this event for rescuing and researching on horseshoe crabs. And this activity was really interesting and it was an immersion into a hands-on experience of muddy, muddy legs, running in the mud and moving out of their comfort zone. Next slide, please. So besides the horseshoe crab program, other activities that NSS organizers include the guided nature walks, bird watching, butterfly watching, and workshops as well. And some of these activities are open to the public, but some are for members only. And you can join the Nature Society as members to enjoy more special activities that are open to these members only. And a lot of our members are also families with young children. And, these have joined, and they have joined us in many of our conservation efforts and programs. And this is a very meaningful way to lend a hand in conservation initiatives and learning new things together as a family. So for this event, in, conservation, in conversation with young marine biologists, we run a series of sessions on different marine topics. So yesterday, we had three really interesting and enriching sessions on seahorses, sea stars, and sea anemones. And we believe that the young audience, our young panelists, and the marine scientists also enjoyed all of these sessions. So today, uh, we have had already two talks on giant clams and sea turtles, and this will be our last talk uh, on sharks. But before we begin, I just have a few Zoom tips that I'd like to share for people who are new to Zoom or just attending this talk. So firstly, you would notice that everyone in the audience is muted, except for the panel speakers. So please remain muted throughout this event. And uh, if possible, please turn off your videos because this would help to prevent any lagging since we have so many participants here. Also, if you look at your top right hand corner, uh, you'll see that there's a view button. You can switch to speaker's view and this will let you look at the person who is talking. So at the end of the session, we will have some time for Q&A. So if you have any burning questions for the scientists, please type them in the chat box and send them to the chat box user Q&A. So if you move your cursor to the bottom of the screen, you will see the chat box pop up and you can type your questions in there. We may not be able to answer all the questions due to the timing of the event, but we will definitely try our best. And lastly, this session will be recorded and uploaded to our NSS YouTube channel about one week after the event has completed. So now without further ado, I'd like to introduce our young panelists of today. Very exciting. So first up, we have Adia. Adia, would you like to say hi? Hi. Hi. Yes, yeah, so Adia is 11 years old from Marymount Convent School. And she's an inquisitive and eloquent girl who is completely fascinated by hammerhead sharks. Her first close encounter with marine life was when she had a chance to swim with dolphins on, while on holiday. She has learned the importance of our oceans and how we greatly depend on it through various documentaries. And she is also an award-winning young orator who is also part of her school's Science Olympiad. And she also enjoys playing badminton and reading. So next up, we have Joelle. Joelle, would you like to say hi? Yeah. 
Yes, okay. Hello, Joel. So Joel is 11 years old from ACS Primary, and he is a nature lover and aspiring photographer who loves the deep sea environment. He is fascinated by how animals have evolved in the part of the ocean where it is cold and dark. He imagines it must be like in a time machine when exploring the deep with the strange and wonderful creatures that could be living fossils. And last but not least, we have Kevin. Kevin, would you like to say hi? No. Hello. Yeah, so Kevin is eight years old from Yumin Primary School, and he loves reading about animals and science, especially dinosaurs. He's fascinated to learn about the largest ecosystem on Earth, which is the marine ecosystem. And he has learned how every animal has a role to play and how humans greatly rely on the oceans for food and for work. He hopes to contribute to the protection of our planet and to explore the deepest unknown part of our ocean today. Kevin also loves using his imagination as he plays Lego and Spider-Man toys with his sister, who is his best playmate. So welcome to all the young panelists and we're really excited to hear from you. But even before that, we need to introduce a really important person and that's our marine scientist, Dr. Jerome Koch. Would you like to say hi? Hi, hi everyone. Yes. Glad to have you all here. Yeah. Yes, really nice to have you. So Jerome is an aquatic biologist working at the Civil and Envir Environmental Engineering Department under the National University of Singapore. During his undergraduate studies, he took up an internship in South Africa to participate in great white shark and cetacean studies. He encountered the complexity of shark research and conservation. Shark behavior has changed throughout the research because the sharks could actually adapt to the scientific methods, which was really, really interesting. There was also a vulnerability of working on such large, powerful creatures that has shaped Jerome's interest towards how we can or should interact with our surrounding environment. And in addition to this research, Jerome occasionally participates in environmental related outreach programs and guiding opportunities. So without further ado, I will pass the time on to Jerome. Thanks, Dana. So let me share my screen. Okay, so I'll, I'll just quickly start uh, and give a brief introduction, then I'll let the panelists also introduce a bit about the sharks that they've researched and encountered. Then I'll carry on with a bit more experience and then we'll share and then we'll just discuss along the way. So uh, sharks, so this is a picture of a great white shark. Um, this was what, uh, this is a picture that I took. Um, when I went to South Africa, we did, uh, it was a month long internship. So we just helped out with the research that was there. Um, we looked at the great white sharks that came in. We looked at the, um, we studied their population dynamics. We studied what kind of sharks come in, what kind of sharks go out, how they, how they eat different things. And yeah, so um, more broadly, apart from great white sharks, we also have a lot of other species. So this is just a snapshot of some of the, the species that are a bit more charismatic, a bit more powerful. We might have seen this in, in videos and pictures. Um, Panelists, do you all know how many species of sharks we have? Um, uh, Kevin. We have around... Oh, oh sorry. No, no, Kevin, then Adia. 450. Adia? Same? So I think he's right, but on mm. my research, I think there's 470 and counting. So mm. people like you, they go on internships and they help to discover new sharks. So hats off mm. to you guys. Yeah. Uh, Jorel, is there anything else you want to talk about I, I think you're muted okay. okay in a bit so I, I just comment a bit and then uh, we will carry on so um that's true so along the way we do have different species that are coming up um I think one of you mentioned that there's the, the deep sea is really just so big and so vast we haven't really been able to capture and identify every those species that is there. That's why the numbers keep increasing. Right. So I want to give you guys a chance. Um, any of these sharks that you've done research on that you want to share with everyone about? Okay. So one of the questions that was given in the thing was the blue shark. So the blue sharks, um, you can see that they actually have they have a tinge of blue in the skin. Um, and then for this, the hammerhead sharks are quite popular as well. We see them um, in a lot of pictures, they move around in very big colonies. If you get a chance to dive with them, it's just a um, very different kind of experience. Um, the Mako shark is faster shark. 
treasure sharks are very powerful, right? So, question: Which is the bigger shark? So the bigger the shark world? that has been discovered is mm -hmm. so the bigger shark that lived the biggest fish ever was the megalodon. Mm -hmm. So that was about seventy feet long. It could grow to that length, and the biggest shark that lives today is whale shark. It can grow about forty meters around there. Okay. Uh, second biggest shark that lives today, Kevin. Do you know? Yeah. Okay. Let's go, Kevin. Then we go, Jorel. Basking shark. Basking shark. Jorel, do you know what's the third biggest shark? Give you a hint. I'm 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 gonna talk about it for a bit. Jorel, is your is your mic okay? Uh, okay, Jara, uh, are you are you able to say something? Oh, sorry. Uh, ah, yeah. Okay. Good. Was... Okay. Now, now, now you're back. Good. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh... Third biggest shark. Do you know the third biggest shark that lives today? Mm, is it the mega mouth shark? Uh, that's the fourth. Oh dang. I'm 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 gonna talk about it. I'm gonna talk about it. It's, oh, okay. it's what I researched. Oh, yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh, cool. So it's, okay. it's yeah. the great white. So it's the great white shark. That's the third biggest. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, in Singapore, we we do have some sharks in Singapore. Um, these are some images that we've we've had. You see that uh, recently, some of our environmentalists they actually observed uh fishing nets that that kept, that caught some of the sharks in the, and then that that strangled and caused the sharks to drown. And then uh, we also have other things like the black tip reef sharks. So these are the sharks that um, we find them ar around the shallower areas, the coral reefs. And then you also have the bull shark coming once in a while. So so these are the kind of sharks that we have in Singapore. But so far, no great white sharks. Don't have the bigger bigger sharks. But we, we do have sharks in Singapore. So that's something for us to think about, to learn how to conserve and learn how to appreciate. So... Quiz. Uh, this time I want to let Jorel answer first because I think just now you took a while to to get the mic running. Do you know what this is? Um, is that a a shark's egg? Like, is yes. a Port Jackson a Port Jackson shark's egg, or is it like a mermaid's purse? Yes, correct. So these are mermaid. Oh, okay. uh, they, there are a lot of different names for it. Uh, this one's actually from the bamboo shark. So we do see that there are some sharks that actually lay eggs like this. Um, do you guys know what other ways of production that sharks have? Okay, uh, Kevin, then yes. Adia. Okay, let's go Kevin, Adia, then Jorel. Uh, do you produce live young? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, any examples of sharks that you know that produce live young? No. Okay, then, then let's go on to Adia first. Adia. I know. Okay, mm -hmm. I know also. So I okay. think it's a, shen, a sand tiger shark, and mm -hmm. I'll, I want to share a bit more about them, about their okay. embryos. So it's a bit cruel process, but it's reality. So mm -hmm. what happens in a sand tiger shark's womb is called embryonic cannibalism. So it's a process where the biggest embryo, the biggest shark, will go around the womb and eat up all its younger siblings. So after this process has happened, the sand tiger shark the mummy she won't produce any more fertilized eggs or embryo she will just produce the unfertilized eggs so that her surviving offspring can eat it so it can feast on their egg yolks anytime it wants so it grows up in this eggy soup and when it's once it's fully developed then the mother will give birth to it mm, that's excellent yeah excellent uh Jorel, do you have any other examples any other Yes, another yeah. example of um of a shark giving birth is the lemon shark. Mm -hmm. It's it it it's it's um so basically when when uh the lemon shark lays its eggs in fresh water. So after they lay the egg, after so after the egg hatches, the lemon sharks would go would go into this 
place it's like a sanctuary and they'll go grow up there for seven years and after seven years they'll uh go out of that so, what we call like some sort of shark sanctuary um then they'll go out to sea and repeat the process again and again okay very good um kevin do you have any thing else to comment so let me ask you a question about this so you see the eggs right they have all these little tendrils at the end of it what, what what do you think they're for i do you have some oh, do you have something Jora? do you have some thoughts i i think they're supposed to like hang <laughs> sorry that's my dog okay, okay. No, um, no worries. i i think they're supposed to uh like hang on those rocks and seaweed so it, they won't float away right that's very good so you know how sometimes your your rope and your string gets tangled up on different things so it's the same function so all these things they'll get tangled up at different structures in the ocean or floor and then that's how the eggs stay in the same place so this this is a uh, mermaid's purse on the shark's egg okay so i'll just quickly talk a bit about what i did in south africa and then we can move on and let and, and ask you guys a bit more questions so i went to south africa um this is at the south southern tip of south africa it's a place called mossel bay and where we did our studies was around this area called uh, seal island so this is seal island It's literally a crop of rock in the middle of a lagoon where there's a lot of seals that just gather there so this is the process of the research that the part of the research that we did. So um, we had to chum and bait the sharks. So chumming, you guys know what this is? Or you guys know what chumming is? Or, or have you seen the word before anywhere? So um, I think that chum are parts of fish that can be put on rod and uh, they can be put on the long strings that you put. So you put it on a hook and put it in the ocean to attract the shark. Okay, so that's that's correct. So part part of so how how we did it here. These are actually um a sardine, right? When you keep it for very long, then it gives off this very fishy smell. So what we do is we take the water of the sardine where it's just very fishy, and we just throw it overboard, and then just the smell of it, it just attracts the shark nearby. And then when the shark is close enough, we use a uh, tuna to actually uh, bait the shark up. So we bait the shark up and then what we want to see is this. So the shark will actually come up. See on the right side, the shark will actually come up. And then that's where we identify and we see the shark. And then that's how we identify this is a shark and we take down the characteristics. So if we don't get sharks, basically we're just sitting on the boat, looking out, looking around. You can see, you can see it's actually pretty safe, right? We can sit all the way at the edge of the boat and... You know, it's not like those movies where, you know, the shark's going to attack the boat and, you know, uh, attack everyone on it. It's, it's, I mean, sharks are also afraid of um, very big structures and very big shadows. And yeah, so just, you know, there's a bit, it's, it's, it's quite interesting, a very different kind of perspective that we get. So when we actually do shark uh, baiting, this is what we see. So you see, we use the meat to actually pull the shark and, and not, not pull the shark make the shark come up above water and then what we really want to see is this dorsal fin right at the end right so question what is the dot why, why do we want to see the dorsal fin so as the slide suggests sometimes oh. scientists will catch and they will flip them over to put them in a trance so then they'll put a tag uh tag on the dorsal fin so they can track it and sometimes if there's advanced technology available then that tag can actually you know tell you if it if it has mated given birth or if it's not alive sometimes it can do that uh -huh. so it's very distinctive so if you get a, get a glimpse of it then you can know it's there it's not there okay so that's that's one of it so one of the things that we do is we, we try to tag the shark and then maybe down the line 10 20 years if we see the shark come back we, we know that it's that same shark but what what other things can we tell from the dorsal fin itself. Kevin, do you have any thoughts? So, so see the title of this. This is a dorsal ID. So think, think about how, how do we differentiate different people? How do we tell 
one person apart from a different person. It's like a fingerprint. Right, okay, we, we go down to Jorel first, then we come back to Adia. Jorel? Um, basically, uh, they have the tag there so they can tell if it's uh if it's uh if the if it's the shark they tag before okay. i'm not really sure okay what what if there's no tag okay let's go uh uh adia first adia okay so uh this might not be very accurate but mm -hmm. first of all you know the black tip sharks you can tell mm -hmm. the species of the shark also mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that and another thing you can also tell if a shark is injured. If someone has cut off its fin, then you know that people are hunting sharks in that area. So that okay. also, and it, you can also tell if it's been attacked or if, or if it has any disease. And the last but most important thing is that there will be a shape of mm. the dorsal fin that is unique to every species. So you can know what type of species you've caught. I hope that's correct. Mm. Okay, wait, uh, Kevin, Kevin has something to say. To identify the shark. Yes, correct. That's great. So, so all of what you guys said, bits and pieces of it. That's that's why we want to see the dorsal fin. Uh, what happens? Uh, typically, uh, how how can we tell the age of the shark? Sometimes we um need get the specimen of the shark and then we count the number of the bone structure and all this. But we can't do that for wild sharks because then you have to kill the shark. So what we do is we look at the dorsal fin. We look at various uh, scarring patterns. We look at various structures, whether there's any injuries. And then from there, you can tell this is shark A, shark B, this is shark D. And then you can see whether the sharks are coming back. Yeah, so that's why the dorsal fin is very important. So these just on the left, they look cool. But for researchers, they don't really want it. So I, yeah, so they only want the dorsal fin photos. But I want the photos of the face. So another question. So this... um. The, the question is here, so which is the shark attack? So there are two pictures. You can see these are the same sharks, right? Because on the... Actually, can you see the mouth when I move the mouse around on the screen? Yes, okay. So you can see they're scarring here, just as they're scarring here. And you can see there's this big gash right at the eye and the big gash here as well. So it's the same shark. But now, which is the shark attack? Um, so, you didn't, so you mean which one has been attacked? No, no, which one? So so these are two different versions of the shark biting the bait. One of it is an attack, one of it isn't an attack. So which do you think is the attack? Mm. And and how can you tell the difference? Okay, first, what's, what's the difference between I... the two sharks? Okay, Kevin. One shark is biting the end, and one shark is biting, like, has has quarter of it in the mouth. Quarter of it in the mouth. Okay, which, which shark is which? Mm. So the one that has a quarter is the this one? No, the other this one. one. Okay, so you think this is the the not the attack? No. Okay, so not the attack. Uh anyone else has Adia? Okay, Adia? So I think that Kevin is right because the mm -hmm. second picture, the one that is not outlined, so the shark is going very sneakily. Its dorsal fin is not seen. So it's mm -hmm. it's attacking and this is a great white shark. So great white sharks specialize in sneak attacks. Mm -hmm. They will stalk their prey and keep their dorsal fins below the water so as to not alert them. And mm -hmm. then when they are close enough, when they make one fatal mistake, when the prey makes one tiny mistake, it will jump and goodbye to whatever unfortunate fish it decides to hunt that day. Okay. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys a hint and then Jor, I'll see if you can figure it out. So look at the eyes. The eyes are different. Yes, I can That's tell. It. Yes, that. so which which do you think is a shark attack? Mm. Uh, okay. I would think it would. Go for it. Um, That's just guess, okay, yeah. Mm. I'm just gonna guess the second picture. This this one in the frame, or or this one, the the the, the big one. This one, okay. So th this is this is very interesting. So I I learned this only when I was there. 
Um, the reason why this shark is actually has uh, eyes white is because it's roll it rolls its eye back, and and for ver for other species of sharks, what happens is they actually have a membrane that will protect the eye. Because what happens is when they actually try to catch, say, like seals or other fish, uh, sometimes the fish or the seals will actually scratch the shark. And so it will protect its eye because its eye is very important for hunting. Right? So this picture in the frame is actually the one where it's hunting. And this one isn't. So you can see. So, so then this bite is very interesting because this first bite is a curious bite. Right, so when when I I give you something unique, you 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 will use your hands to touch and to feel what it is, but for sharks they don't have hands, so the first bite it tends to be just a curious bite, see what it is, and then the second one, and then this other one where it actually rolls its eye back, that's that's where it is going in for the hunt. Yeah. So, um, I'll I'll, I'll talk a bit more about the shark, uh, hunting. And then this video was one that we took. Uh, you see this string goes out to the back. It actually is uh, a bait that we actually trail on top of the, of the ocean. So what happens? So what happens in this sort of videos is very typical. You see in a lot of documentaries, the shark actually comes up to jumps out and it attacks the, the thing on top of the of the of the surface of the water wait okay so um what the shark actually sees below the water is this this is the silhouette of the seal and as it swims across this is what the shark sees on the right but then when people surf you also see that it's kind of similar kind of so the shark doesn't really know which is which from below sometimes they come up to get a very curious bite but because they have such strong bite. Their first bite causes damage, like it, it injures people, and then people get scared and they swim away, and then that that just frustrates and angers the shark even more. So, quick question: What what do you what what should you do if you see a shark in the water, like like just there? Okay, uh, Adia. Um. So, if you wanna avoid a shark attack, first of all, don't don't so you should never ever like not face a shark. So you should always be face to face with it. And if you're gonna swim, don't turn your back on it and swim away. This will like cause it to become agitated. So don't do that. Mm. And don't oh, just move your hands a lot in the air. So that will cause the shark, oh, this is my prey. It's struggling, this is my prey. And the last mm. thing, never do this. On your life, yeah. never do this. Don't okay. act dead. If you act dead, the shark will just start eating you. Mm. You can't avoid it. So don't act dead. So first of all, stay calm. Mm -hmm. Second of all, don't turn your back on the shark. And third of all, don't act dead. Okay. So in front of the shark, there is this a lot of things in its in its snout, right? That it has very strong sensory organs. Uh, do you guys know the name of that 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 structure? Is it olfactory organs? Uh yes, it's that, but there's a there's a very special name for it. It's it's three words. It's ampullae of something. Do you guys know? Okay, now I'll give it to you guys. So it's ampullae of Lorenzini. Uh, as Adia said, it's actually olfactory and various other sensors that detect uh electrical signals in the water. Um, what what they tell us to do if we see a shark is to do this. You just you just nudge it on the snout and push it away because. If you struggle, a shark will try to attack even more, and you you cannot outswim a shark. Yeah. So so what Adia said is correct. Don't don't struggle. Just just nudge it on the nose, nudge it on the nose a bit, so the shark gets nudged away. And you can see a lot of videos of people diving with sharks. It's not necessarily always dangerous, right? Okay. So next question: What do sharks eat? Um. I okay, know. I see Kevin put up his hand. So let's do Kevin, Jorel, and then Adia. Okay, Kevin. Fish, seals, and and sometimes uh, small mammals. Okay, uh, so hmm. okay, so just now Dana also mentioned that uh, in shark tail there was vegetarian shark. Are there sharks that don't eat meat? Yes. Okay, Jorel, go for it. Yes. Um. 
Yeah, and uh, like sharks, like basking sharks and mm -hmm. whale sharks eat plankton. Mm -hmm. And okay. yeah, those those are a, a few examples of sharks. That... What's, what's the word that we use for the way that they eat plankton? It starts with um, F. Filtering? Yes, correct. Very good. Uh, Adia, do you have anything else to add? So, I also read that they eat seahorses sometimes if there's nothing else to eat. And they can eat even another type of shark, another smaller type of shark. Mm. If good. there's so nothing they... else to eat, then they will just go for their own kin. Mm. Very good. So, um, bonus question. Sharks actually change, uh, great white sharks actually change their diet along the way as they grow up. So sometimes, so they tend to eat fish at one point, and then at one point they tend to eat, to, to switch to seals. So the question is which, um, do you think it's the bigger sharks that eat the seals or the bigger sharks that eat fish? Bigger sharks that eat seals. Yes, correct. Very good. So the, so you can, so we actually see it in the, in the, during the research where, you know, the sharks, the, the bigger sharks tend to go for seal attacks and then the smaller ones, they tend to eat the, the tuna or other fish that they, but sharks are generally very broad eaters. So they can eat any meat that is available to them. Especially Unless of the... course, you're... oh, sorry. Yes. Sorry. sorry. Uh, go ahead. Oh, no. So I, I was just saying that, um, of course, Joria is also correct in that the whale sharks and the basking sharks actually just filter feed on plankton. Yes, I did. Uh, let's yeah, add another thing. So, mm. tiger sharks are infamous for eating like everything they mm. can find, that everything they, that they can eat. So, one of the most weirdest things that have been found in a tiger shark's stomach. So, license plates, a dead mm. dog, dog, dog leeches, and the most mm. puzzling thing birth control pills. Think about oh. it. Birth okay. control pills. So people throw stuff and then the sharks just eat it all up. Yeah, so yeah. whatever we throw into the ocean actually affects the, the yeah. That's interesting. Okay, um, let's move on a bit. So, so we talked about sharks being uh, scary. We talked about sharks being feared. And I think just now before the session, we actually talked a bit also about uh, why do people fear sharks. So I want to flip it around a bit and just put the question forward, like what? What might sharks be afraid of? What might sharks actually... Okay, I see a lot of hands go. I saw Kevin first, then Adia, then maybe Jorel. Okay, Kevin. Dolphins, uh, like orcas and humans. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, Adia? So, I... The, the thing that they will be afraid of the most is dolphins. So, the reason why this is because dolphins are very flexible. So you know, sharks are also quite flexible, but dolphins are more flexible. So what they do is, if there is a shark, the dolphin will swim under it and then change direction with its head, the tip of its nose, it'll go and poke the shark's underbelly. So this jab can be so serious that it will cause a lot of internal damage, sometimes internal bleeding too. So the sharks will do anything not to cross okay. paths with a dolphin or dolphins. Okay. Okay. Or... Okay. Ken, uh, Jorel, you have anything else? Um. Yeah. That there, there was actually news about a great white shark being killed by a pod of orcas. Mm -hmm. So, um, because they are actually more fierce than great white sharks, and mm -hmm. because they hunt in a pod, it makes harder for sharks to try and escape so mm. their instincts are to like circle the prey so it does sometimes circle a shark and mm. boom it's dead dead body reported mm. okay good uh i want to just push up a bit more what what's the method of killing the shark that the orcas have are thought to do um kevin do you know okay yes kevin i see your hand up uh, they use their snouts to uh, hit the gills the, to hit the gills, you said? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's great. Then, um, earlier, earlier, Adia also mentioned something about how the the sharks actually enter a trance state, right? Do you have any thoughts about that, Kevin? 
uh, okay, hang on. Yeah, let's let's see if Joel has something, anything to add. Joel, do you have? I see your hands up. Oh well, yeah, since uh you're talking about threats to sharks, mm -hmm. the, uh, sh should I be talking about shark finning here? Sure, sure. Or I mean, how? Go, go for it. We, we, we will cover both together in this, this few minutes. So you can talk a bit about it. Yeah. So I want to talk about how people threaten sharks. I mm -hmm. mean, there are only a few sharks getting eaten by humans. You like, I mean, there are only a few, uh, like a few humans getting eaten like sharks around like four or five people. But there are like millions of like 4,000 people eating shark fins, drinking shark fin soup, which is very irritating. But luckily, it, nowadays it has decreased a bit. Mm -hmm. But if your granny comes or if your grandmother comes to say, Oh, hello, dear. Would you like to drink some shark fin soup? Okay, just just deny it or just run away. Okay, because... Okay. Uh, yeah. It's actually okay. threatening them a lot, and they can't mm. swim properly without their dorsal fins, so they'll eventually die. And because mm. some, because sharks need to constantly swim to uh, get water in, in their gills, with the exception mm. of a few sharks like the wobby gong, for example, mm -hmm. uh, they'll, since they can't swim, they'll just drown. So yeah, stop shark finning. Uh, stop finning. Stop cutting the fins from sharks. That's okay. That's, good point. Okay, wait. I, I I want to. I want to show you guys this video first. So this video is about um how orcas actually attack uh sharks and and then and then after that we'll go on a bit more to the human aspect of it. That's the trans state. Okay, so that, that was an uh, example of the whole shark in a trance state and um, how orcas actually use that to actually hunt sharks. Uh, Kevin, you have your hands up. You have something to say? What was that red thing that came out of the shark's mouth? The what? They came out of the shark's mouth? Oh, the, the, the thing that the shark was eating at the end? No, the red thing that came out of the shark's mouth. <laughs> In the Maybe video, it's blood. yeah, I, I think I think that represents blood. blood. But that, that was an animation, so they just wanted to show that that was how the shark was was being a. Yeah. Okay. So now now we talk a bit more about what uh Jorah actually, uh mentioned. Okay. So these are the uh, another aspect of what sharks can be afraid of. So we have threats to shark, and these are the human human effects. So earlier we talked about fishing net. And then we talked about uh, shark finning as well. There's also another issue, uh, overfishing. So if we eat a lot of the fish, then sharks have nothing to eat. And then that also threatens them. So question, why do people eat shark fin? What's, what's interesting about shark fin? 
Okay, there's Adia, nothing oh, interesting. Okay, Jarrell, yeah. There's nothing really interesting in my opinion, but it, in China, they think it's some sort of Chinese cuisine, and they think it's, oh my god, it's a treat to eat it. Mm. But, yeah, it's they, they think it's like, oh my gosh, you did well, so here you go, shark, shark. yeah, it's a delicacy. It, it, so they, they uh, it's like caviar it's made out of uh sturgeon sturgeon mm. eggs but does it taste good not really okay but because it's a delicacy some people think it tastes mm. nice okay like durian <laughs> okay uh adia then kevin okay so first of all i want to cover so since joel has given you all the facts on why people are doing this because it's a delicacy and in chinese culture it represents status and wealth eating it and serving it both so that's bad and that's sad you know why does eating an animal killing an animal why is it a source of happiness and pride for people yeah and one more thing people also kill sharks to make cartilage pills so mm-hmm. they are believed to cure diseases and mm-hmm. uh, but one thing the world has done well in chinese government banquets shark fin soup is no longer allowed to be served this is a move that is hailed by most shark uh, by the people who love sharks and who, those who want to save them mm correct yeah uh okay kevin yes kevin there is nothing good about the shark fin but uh, i know something that's bad about it mm-hmm. it has really high levels of of solvent of solidified versions of the element mercury which is highly highly toxic yes correct so essentially essentially the taste in shark's fin soup actually comes from what other things you put into the soup the fin itself is more of a reputation symbol than than other things so you're, you're right a lot of places are starting to move away from it um, but there are still a lot of places that still eat it. So that's something that, um, as Jorel said, if if people try to offer it, just tell them no or, or run away, right? <laughs> so uh, earlier earlier before the thing, we also talked a bit about some of the movies that we've watched, some of the movies that we you we um are related to sharks, and I think Dana also mentioned a few. Do you think movies have a very big impact on how people view sharks? Uh, yes, I yes, I do. Yeah, I think that movies have a big, big, big part to play about how people think about sharks. So okay, any Jaws, examples? Yeah, okay, Jaws. Jaws. I, I, both of them have a very, very big impact about how okay. people think about sharks. So in okay. Jaws, there were a lot of unprovoked attacks. Mm. In Meg, it literally came to a beach and dragged away so many boats. And okay. It, I can remember one scene where one the the groom fell into the water from the wedding chair and the mag mm. ate it. So that was yeah. disturbing. But the thing is that in jo- in Meg, if you watch carefully, there's one thing that we realize: we discover the mag and we destroy it. We can't let it live in peace. If mm. they had not gone to go and oh dig it, dig it, I want to see it, I want to see it, it would have been alive. You okay. know. Yeah, good point. So that's that's generally the theme of a lot of these movies. Joel, you had something to say? Yes. Also, there's another reason why people are afraid of sharks. It's also because of you know Jaws uh, and mega scary movies. So mm-hmm. people think, oh my gosh, if sharks are like that in movies, it must happen in real life. Which is why people try and see shark run away or try and kill them. Which, mm-hmm. like, say, scientists had an experiment, so they put nice music, so they let a bunch of people watch a shark, a, a shark documentary, so they split up in two groups. This group watched a shark move, the shark documentary, with night with uh, with happy music, and the other one with scary music. The one in scary music said the the shark was terrible and scary and horrifying but the one but the other group said that the shark was cool relaxed and awesome mm-hmm. which obviously yeah, yeah <laughs> okay uh, impacted how sharks are mm. like yeah um yeah kevin do you have any 
thoughts about this. So, so contrast between say shark movies and you know like uh dolphin or orca movies. Have you seen any dolphin or orca movies? No. Uh, any shark movies that you come across? Do Do you think Do you think uh shark movies are unfair to sharks? Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. So um, yeah. So I think there's a lot of different things that that we can we can manage ourselves, even though like all these sharks that we've looked at and studied is all like out in the open ocean, all the way in South Africa. But even even things like how we perceive the danger of, associated with sharks, their role in the ecosystem, all these things in Singapore are things that we can manage and we can help to address. And in this way, then we can impact and affect the kind of things that go on all the way, even in places like Africa, right? And I think with that, we can take some questions from the audience. But let me hand the time back over to Dana for this. Yeah, hello, Dana. everyone. Yeah. Mm. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful sharing. It was really interesting to hear from so many of the young panelists, as well as um, from Dr. Koch. Thank you so much. So now we will be just moving quickly to questions. So I'm sure that a lot of you have sent in uh, many different questions to uh, the Q&A person, but we'll just give you a little bit more time to send it right now. So we'll just give you seconds. All right, so now we have our questions in. Okay, so we have some really interesting questions from all the, the audience members today. So this will be really interesting. Okay, so our first question is from Vidisha and she asks, how do sharks get their tint? <laughs> get their tint as in the color, is it? I think so, yes. Ah, Sorry. okay. So uh, I think various, um, I think based on just the way that wait, do any of the panelists know this? Do you want to jump in and? So maybe I think that the color is in their DNA, so it's inherited from their parents, and sometimes there are some pigments in their skin that change the color of their skin. Like let's say the blue sh the blue shark is actually blue, so it's the pigment in its skin. It's not like suntan or anything. It's like the pigment in their skin that makes them that color. And sometimes in their DNA, it's like this to help them blend in with the water so that their prey can't see them. Okay, yes. Uh, I, I, think, I think just to add on to that. So um, the way that the sharks are colored, it's uh, gray or blue from the top. And then at the bottom, it's white. So over time, this has just been the color that has worked for the sharks. Because when you look from the top, um, being grey or blue actually camouflages them, so you can't really see uh, them clearly. And then from the bottom, you see white, which is against the sunlight. So this this thing is called uh, counter shading. It's it's very good camouflage for the shark. So that's why it's evolved over time. Uh, I see Kevin has his hand up. Is there a prehistoric whale that ate sharks? Uh, actually, not that I'm very. For me, not not that I, I I don't know about this, but have you read anything about that before? Yeah, I think it's called lives living something. Ah, okay. I, I'm not I'm not too familiar with that, but probably there might have been, because in the past there were a lot of different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It looked like a sperm whale, and its head was bigger than the uh, mouth. Ah, okay. Uh, I'm not too familiar with this, but I I I need to check, and then we can find out a bit more. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Mm. We have another question. Um, are the sharks in Singapore dangerous? Um, can I answer this one? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, maybe you can just comment a bit okay. about it. So there are a few breeds of shark in Singapore. There is the bamboo shark. There is the tiger shark, the bull shark also. So most people think that tiger sharks and bull sharks are very dangerous and all. But as far as I know, there have been no attacks on people. There, there's been one attack, but so they're not really dangerous, our local sharks. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah. oh, sorry. Yeah, I think just, just to add on, um, bull sharks tend to be aggressive. 
but I mean, normally the way that we encounter shark, we don't really, uh, it's, it's more our, our benefit than the sharks. Like the, we, we have home ground advantage because we are normally approaching them from say the jetties or on from boats or from, from the coastal line. So, um, I mean, even, even things like bull sharks, although they're aggressive, I mean, as long as you don't go and actively try to disturb them or attack them, they, they tend to be quite shy. Yeah. In fact, I've, I've only seen like, a black tip reef shark and they they run away when i come near yeah so i don't think it's really but i, I won't say that they're not dangerous because if they were to attack it is dangerous but the thing is they don't they don't naturally try to attack people yeah mm. yes uh, thank you jerome and adia yeah. all right so our next question is by nicholas and it is how do shark catch its prey ah okay so there are different ways. Um, may I? Uh, oh, who, who said that? I am Joel. Oh, sure, sure. Go, go for it, yeah. Okay, so it's the way they catch sharks is actually depending on the species. So if it's like sharks that lie on the bottom, like the angel shark or wabi gong, because they are, the way they look, they are camouflaged in the sand. So when prey just goes on top of them, they quickly lunge up at the prey and eat it and gobble it quickly. Nom, nom, nom. For the goblin shark, it has a protrusion, which is their snout, which it uses like a metal detector to detect prey in the murky water of the deep sea. So then, once it finds prey, it, it, its mouth moves so fast, you need slow-mo to even see the mouth open and eat the fish, which is a, also a very good strategy. So, and because life is scarce in the deep sea, they need to use these tactics and all to catch prey. Mm. And as for the great white shark, it's actually, uh, it just follows its prey, which is a seal. It just follows it, and at the right moment, it just goes up, and then it just lunges out of the ocean. I mean, it just lunges out, out of the water and just eats it. But it, it's like a 50-50 chance it might, I mean, it might es the seal might escape, or it might get eaten. But yeah. the, uh, there's another competition. Uh, what, what, you want to say something? Oh, no, no, go, go ahead. I'm just agreeing with you. I, I'm agreeing with oh, you. Yeah. So after they eat the seal, the, the other great white sharks may come and try to steal the meal like thieves. So mm. yeah, they kind of have to be careful after because they burn they burn a lot of energy after doing all these prey catching because seals themselves are also very good predators and are and are very fast so they mm. they are so uh great white sharks need a lot of muscles and um yeah. and need to be very fast to catch up with their prey i hope yep. that answers right. your question yep I, I think that was very comprehensive i think various other strategies so like the treasure shark uses its tail to whip different different uh prey that it finds in the water and that stuns it and then it can eat it so various different things and then uh whale whale sharks i don't think we call it hunting plankton but you know they just swim through the plankton and everything that goes in just filter feeds so lots of yeah but it's sometimes it, yeah. it, it, uh, they sometimes eat small fish too so they aren't really vegetarian they're yeah. more of like a bit a little opportunistic, bit opportunistic kind of yeah more. yeah it's like whatever they find, can find is they can fit into yeah, their mouth so they, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like om nom 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 nom. nom. Yeah. I have a big You're mouth, fine. and I will not. I will not stop to use it. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Are there other OIT? Uh, Dia has her hand up. But do we have more questions? Yeah, yeah sorry. Maybe? No yeah. questions, so we will just okay. move on really quickly. Mm. But thank you, Joel and Jerome. Yeah. Um. So our next question is by Adina, and she asks, "Why would a dolphin hit a shark? Like hit, hit, or hit the shark?" Yes. So, so uh, basically, the aim is to to stun the prey. So you see, in, even uh, a lot of a lot of uh, animals tend to do this. So dolphins sometimes, when they see a school of fish, they like to swim around the fish and use uh, bubbles to try and uh, confuse confuse the whole school of uh, fish, and then from there they'll go and hunt the ones that that fall out and get confused. So for hitting the shark, it's similar. You try and confuse the shark and make it enter that 
that state of a trance. And then once the shark is trance, basically they are vulnerable to being attacked. So that's the first step. Yeah. Mm. Yes, thank you, yeah. Jerome. Mm. All right, and we have um, one last question. And that is, what are the ancestors of the shark by Isaac? Um, can I answer this one? Oh, sure. Go for it. Okay, um, so the ancestor of the great white, you can say, so great white is the most common one. So the ancestor of the great white is believed to be the megalodon. The megalodon is way, way larger, but it hunted the same way as the great white, and it looks quite similar, although it's not necessary for its belly to be white. But any great white you find, the belly will always be white. It can be black, gray, blue, anything on the top, but its belly will always be white. So the ancestor, to answer your question, the ancestor of the great white was the megalodon. And it evolved to be smaller and faster. Despite being smaller, it's much faster. And some scientists believe that the reason for the extinction of the megalodon was competition from its younger cousin, the great white, who could eat up all the prey before the megalodon could move. Despite its sheer size, it can't move fast enough. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope I've yeah. answered your question. I think that, that was, that, that sounds right. <laughs> that was mostly it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for helping with the answer. Hey, thank you, Adia and Jerome. All right, so we have unfortunately ran out of time. So we're so sorry to everyone that we were not able to answer your questions. Um, but thank you once again, uh, Jerome, for this very informative and enlightening session. And we would once again like to thank our young panelists, Kevin, Adia and Jorel, uh, who came on board today to share what they knew. Like today, I've learned so much. I've learned that we can identify sharks using their fins. They can be attacked by orcas. But unfortunately, one of the main threats that sharks face is overfishing. And we've talked a lot about sharks' fins this panel. And definitely, as Arya mentioned, that we are hopefully moving away from these, um, these uh, destructive fishing habits. And therefore, because more people are more aware of how awesome sharks are. So if you enjoyed this session, we hope that you will continue to support the Nature Society of Singapore. So in general, Nature Society does nature conservation and education outreach to the public, uh, such as um, nature-based education and engaging the public for collecting and, and uh, analyzing environmental data. So however, um, next slide, please. NSS is an NGO, a non-government organization, and it runs mostly on volunteers. So if you do feel inclined to support our work, uh, please join us as members. And we also welcome any donations of any amount. And this will help to go to fund our environmental programs or lend weight in just advocating for nature in general. So next slide, please. You can find uh, us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, on our website, and as well as Twitter. And so once again, we'd just like to extend our special thanks to all the marine scientists and biologists who came on board, especially for this session, Jerome. And once again, we'd like to express our gratitude to everyone who made this event possible, such as our young panelists, once again, Kevin, Adia, and Jerome, and our moderator, um, Jerome, for sharing the knowledge with us today. So we've come to the end of our session, as well as the end of this entire series. So on behalf of the speakers and everyone from NSS Marine Conservation Group, we'd like to thank you all and wish you a very good day. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks, everyone.